Hi, welcome to another edition of Your Health Matters with Dr. Benjamin Bryant, Chief of Staff and General Surgeon for UH County Medical Center. You know, about, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks ago, I asked Doc, since we were entering the summer season, if you could set up a show um, regarding heat stroke and sun, uh, things we have to do for sun uh, to keep it us healthy. And I had been asked by several people for Dr. Bryant to do this. Immediately he got on it and uh, graciously set up an interview today with Dr. Kumar. And um, Doc, it's, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. I think it's interesting that uh, this is the time and the heat has been hot. Oh boy, we finally got the real deal. Yeah. We finally got the real summer. And just to kind of underscore what, what Pat just said, um, please let us know if there are any things that you would like to have covered. You, know, you can let Pat know, you can let me know, you can let Matthew know. Uh, any, any topics, any questions you have, and then we'll, we'll uh, arrange to have those addressed on one of the shows, which is again available on YouTube after it's done running on the, uh, on the, uh, cable, channels. the cable channels through the city. So uh, uh, that just serves to underscore the fact that this is your show, that this is, that this is a public service, and the more we know about what you want to hear, the, the more we can uh, tailor it exactly for what you're interested in. And uh, we are uh, uh, very glad to have Dr. Kumar with us today. Uh, people are getting to know Dr. Kumar, especially if they come to the hospital. He uh, is, is really uh, everywhere in the hospital these days. And, and uh, when patients need to be admitted to our hospital frequently, he's the one to do it. And he's taken the time this morning to uh, come in and sort of help us prepare for summer and stay out of trouble. So Dr. Kumar, uh, thanks for coming in. And uh, uh, people do get in trouble in the heat in summer. And what kind of things happen? What happens to people? Okay. Um. Well, uh, good morning to all of you. Um, in the summertime, there are multiple problems with exposure to sun. And I'm kind of focusing mostly on the heat stroke, but I will talk about some other problems too. Okay. Um, most of you know what a heat, is, uh, heat is stroke and some of you don't know. So I, will, I just want to tell you, when the, when the body so we all know that the body temperature is around 98, maybe one degree more or one degree less. When the temperature of the body is more than 104, 104, then it comes under the category of that the patient may have heat stroke. So they have to get up to 104. 104. But I want to mention this thing. It's not always the case that in 100% of the population, the temperature has to be 104. Most of the time, if the patient are elderly, like if they cross the age of 75, 80 years, if they have kidney problem, if they have diabetes, if they have liver problem, that temperature can be less and they still have heat stroke. And uh, as Dr. Kumar will, uh, will go into, uh, heat stroke is 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 a dangerous thing. It's a it's a definite thing. It's you know pe people can can be out there running around and feel like they're really hot, yeah. and it's uncomfortable. But that's not heat stroke. That's not the heat stroke. Okay. What what is heat stroke? Okay, so heat stroke we classify with the temperature, and the other thing, the heart rate will be very high. Heart rate goes up. It goes up. The third thing, the breathing gets faster because you are not able to catch up with the with the with your breathing and the oxygen, the blood. That's why you breathe faster. And the and the last and some other symptoms like cramps in the muscle. That means muscles are getting injured. And. Uh, in the last patient can have altered mental status. That means he doesn't know where he's, he, he is talking, something which does not make sense, or he pass out, or dizziness, headache, all these symptoms. Blurry vision, or symptoms like stroke. 
like hemiparesia, hemiplegia or something. So people can feel like they get weakness or yes. shaky or yeah. lose sensation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what we're talking about here are profound, a profound impact on the organs of the body and the yes. functioning of the body, which is dangerous. Yeah, the in the heat and stroke you have effect on the kidney, the heart, and the liver. In addition to other organs, but these are the main thing, including brain. You don't know whether the heat is affecting your kidney, your heart, until unless you seek the medical advice and the doctor runs some tests and they found out you have kidney problem or the liver problem in addition to a stroke, what you have. So it would be important for, um, like if I was having heat stroke, I probably wouldn't realize it. It would be somebody that would be with yeah, me. Exactly, because, be. because if you have a stroke, it's in that extreme stage. That means you don't know anything about your body. Mm -hmm. Somebody will go on to attend you, and the best thing is to call the 911. Okay. I will tell you what you can do on the spot before the paramedics come. Okay. That's important, which you can do right on the spot. Um, the first of all, we have to understand where this heat is coming from and where this heat is going outside of our body. So whenever we work, our muscles are working. That means they are producing the heat. Um, this heat has to go outside in the environment. So how we do that? The most important thing is the sweating. So when we work, we sweat and the heat comes out in the form of sweating and it dissipates in the environment. But when the temperature outside is very high, you don't have enough sweating and enough heat to load into the environment. And that's why you trap the heat inside your body. So the environment changes, the environment heats up or the humidity gets high. Exactly. And you're producing the heat, but you just can't get rid of it. So it builds up. Exactly. And I want, as you told, the humidity plays a very important role. If the humidity is more than 75, that means you will not going to dissipate heat out of your body in any way. That means you are very susceptible to get the heat to stop. Do you have to be movement in movement to get this, or can it come upon you just like if you're sitting out in the sun, sunning yourself? What's your, what's your question? If mm -hmm. Say if you're out sunning yourself in the yes. sun. You're, mm -hmm. you're not moving around, you're just mm -hmm. kind of docile. Mm -hmm. Can you get heat stroke that way? You can get, you can get heat, because the, there's a thing, the, the heat mechanism is controlled by the brain. There is a part of the brain, it's called hypothalamus, okay? If you have any injury to your brain, so that your brain center cannot work. So if you are sitting outside, but your brain center cannot work, then you can get the heat stroke, even then. Okay. So the brain has to function normally to, eva to evacuate the heat out of your body. If the brain is not working very well, even if you are sitting in the sun, not working anything, you can get the heat stroke. Um, now, I'm, I'm, I'm alone a lot during the day. Yeah. My wife works, I'm at home. Um, are there any signs, now I know what you said, there are different signs that we should watch. Is there a way that I could diagnose myself saying, I better get to a doctor or call 911? Yes. As soon as you see whomsoever the patient is not behaving as it should. They are, ta they are talking to you in the morning, they are working outside, you went inside, you came out and you suddenly found that the patient is on the floor or he is drunk, kind of like walking mm -hmm. abnormally. Mm -hmm. The speech is slurred and he is not able to see and he has weakness. That's the time you have to call the ambulance. Now if somebody is alone, mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some of the things that, that, that generally happen, first of all, people just start not feeling well. Mm -hmm. They really don't, you yeah. really don't feel well, okay? So you're out in the sun, you may not be split, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I, I have to turn this off. Um, I have to, I have to. 
Um, um, they're sitting out in the sun. They're uh, they're 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 not working, but mm -hmm. the, but the temperature, you know, it's very hot, mm -hmm. and they may not be able to get rid of the heat because the, the heat is coming in. It's on the skin. The blood runs through the skin. It picks up the heat. It may you may not be able to dissipate enough heat. You could still get overheated. Yeah. Okay. All right. You just start not feeling well. Yeah. And uh, as Dr. Kumar has pointed out, your heart rate is up. Breathing is difficult. You're breathing fast, and you, you feel out of breath, and, and, and you feel sick. Uh, you may be getting into in, into a danger zone at yes. that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are and, and you, but yet you're still thinking clearly enough to to recognize that there's something going on. So that would be the time to call nine one. Well, that would be the time to, to take some action. Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the actions that people can take is to get cool. And, and a way to get cool, number one, immediately get out of the sun. Immediately get out of the sun. Okay, and another thing that people can do, and, and, and you tell me what you think about this, but if you can go and, and rinse off in cool water, okay, and then maybe if you've got a fan, turn the fan on and let it blow on you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're going to start dissipating heat. Heat. Right away. And you might start feeling better. And then if you start, if you get out of the sun and do those things to cool yourself off, you might not need to call 911. Okay. Yeah, that's but if you feel bad enough, you, you don't want to let yourself, like doctor says, you don't want to let yourself get to the point where you're not thinking clearly and then can't call mm -hmm. the number if you're by yourself. Okay. So you have to, you have to understand that, you know, you need to recognize it early and you need to do something about it because it can slip up on you creep up on you and get you in trouble and it can get you in trouble fast and then once once you lose the ability to think clearly or handle the phone or something and you're by yourself you're in trouble I had a question um, so doc and I have been doing this a long time and um, several years ago a doctor was on talking about hyperthermia yeah and he said you can actually get hyperthermia because a lot of senior citizens mm -hmm. didn't keep their houses warm and stuff. You can actually get hyperthermia in your own home. Mm -hmm. And what about heat stroke? If you don't have fans, you don't have uh, air conditioning, can older people get affected by that not being outside? Yeah, uh, it's I I rarely saw that, but it's possible because some of the condition like uh, if they if the patient have diabetes. And it affects the nerve inside the inside body. Diabetes. So you cannot feel the sensation at all. So you don't know how much is the temperature. Mm -hmm. So you may turn it very hot. And in addition to affecting the nerves, it also affects other system. So you cannot feel and you can get hyperthermia. But unlikely to have heat stroke only with the uh, with the heat and all this okay, okay. Yeah. although yeah although uh, you know you see reports in the newspapers every year big cities like Chicago where elderly people are in their apartments yeah. they don't have air conditioning mm -hmm. the heat builds up inside the apartment they're not able to reduce the, the temperature yeah. in their in their room and and you know people die from that yeah you see that quite often it does happen mm -hmm. so again it's just a, it's just you know it, it's it's really not all that complicated you have a certain amount of heat you have to get rid of and you're either able to get rid of it or else you're not yeah and if you can't get rid of it because your environment's too hot whether you're in the sun or not or um, you know you're not sweating enough you get dehydrated or uh, you, you just you, you know you're, you're you're working and you're not aware of how much heat you're producing. There's that balance, and if and if you're supplying more heat than you can get rid of, it, it will build up, and then you'll start getting the symptoms that doctor's talking about. Yeah. yeah. So if a patient, I mean somebody's out there and they start they start whoa boy I really don't feel well they can feel their heart racing and so on. And um, they, 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 they are wise and they say, you know, I better deal with this. Maybe I better get to the hospital. Uh, they'll come to the emergency room. What will happen then? Okay. 
uh, in the emergency room. So first thing I will I will talk about what you can do until paramedics achieve uh, arrive there, and then I will talk about emergency department. When the patient have these symptoms, which I told about the heart rate, breathing, the first thing to do is to get away from the sun. Second thing, if you are not able to take the patient to the to have a shower, what you can do is sprinkle the water on the on the skin or spray the water and put the cooling fan, put the fan on the patient. That will dissipate the heat. Um, these are the things you can do right on the spot before paramedics come. When the paramedics come, they will take the patient to the emergency room. What the what we can do in the emergency room, we have a cooling blanket which we put over the patient and we can supply, we can give the cooling atmosphere to the patient and that's how they can dissipate the heat. These are one of the things, otherwise the heat, whenever it builds up, it affects the other organ. That's a separate topic. It can affect other organ. That's a separate thing. But immediately in the emergency room, they can get the cooling blanket or sometimes the shower. And that's how they do it. But on the spot, it's very important. Spray the water, put the fan, and you will help a great lot. And remember this thing, like the stroke, in the heat stroke, the time is important thing. You don't want to have the heat inside your body for longer time. That means it damaging the kidney, heart, and the muscle. So you have to act right on the spot. That's very important. Yeah. You know, I mean, in extreme cases, there's lots of stuff we can do. You know, when uh, when somebody <coughs> gets to the emergency room. As doctor says that we have a cooling blanket. It's it's actually a blanket, but uh, fluid kind of runs through it and it's cool. I mean, so it doesn't make you warm. It it, it pulls heat out of mm -hmm. you. But the labs will be drawn to see what's going on with the kidneys and the liver and the heart and so on. And um, I have been involved not in many years, but I was involved in a case where somebody came in and, and man, they were hot. Okay, I mean really hot. I can't remember what the temperature was, 105, 106. I, I saw 105, I saw 105.5 one by. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's very dangerous to get that hot. So we had to, we had to do extreme things mm -hmm. to, to cool that patient off. So one of the things we did was we put a nasogastric tube down mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. put very cold fluid mm -hmm. inside the stomach. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's right inside the body now instead of having a heat generator inside your body, you got something that's cooling off because that cool that cool water mm -hmm. in the stomach will pull a lot of heat out of the body. Yeah. Okay, so that was something we had to do. Another thing we, we did was we put a Foley catheter in, a urinary catheter in, okay? And, and we put fluid into the bladder, cold fluid into the bladder. Mm -hmm. That was another way of mm -hmm. getting heat. And then, of course, what happens is the IV fluid that you're getting is cold. So you're introducing cold all over the place. So we were able to bring that patient's temperature down fairly quickly. Really? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I've never heard any of that procedure. Which yeah, way. so those kinds of things can happen. I mean, you get to the emergency room, they'll, they'll get called. Dr. Kumar will be here. He'll, he'll get called. And they'll take a look and they'll see <coughs> what the risk is, how far it's gone, how hot the person is and how fast they have to, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, if it's something where, where wow, we gotta get, you know, we, we're, we're talking about a matter of minutes here, we better get this, sure. there, are, there are things that can be done in the hospital that obviously can't be done outside mm -hmm. to bring the temperature down rapidly. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, Matt, you had a question, wasn't it about, was it about the heat? Yeah, um, hypoglycemic and uh, diabetics, are they more susceptible one way or another to the heat stroke? Yeah, actually, I haven't heard about hyperglycemia, but diabetes, yes, these patients are more susceptible because I told before that the nerve function in the body is less because of uh, high blood sugar. And that's why 
they don't know how much heat is outside. They cannot feel it, and that's why they get wow. more exposure. That's a very good point. And the second thing is that, um, let's say if your car is staying outside in the sun, when you go into the car, it's very hot, okay? So diabetic patients are more susceptible when they go inside the car because of this thing, because they cannot feel, and they are more susceptible. So what you have to do, roll down the windows, open the, open the doors, wait for five minutes, turn the AC on, and then go inside. That's very, very wise. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, if you can't feel it, you can't protect yourself. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit of a uh, uh, technical thing, but um, since there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there on what are called beta blockers. Mm -hmm. Okay, beta blocker is something that's used to to treat. Uh, uh, when the heart rhythm is off, or sometimes they're used for blood pressure, but they're very, very common medications. And one of the things that a beta blocker does is it prevents the heart rate from going up. People on beta blockers have low heart rates, and it's hard for them to raise their heart rates mm -hmm. because the medication won't let them do it. Yes. Now, what happens to people who are getting overheated mm -hmm. but whose heart rate can't go up <coughs> because they're on beta blockers? Yeah, it's possible. So beta blocker is a, it's called metoprolol, carvidrolol, or you must have heard about toprol. So these are the medication which we give for the heart to protect the heart, to decrease the heart rate so that the heart will work normally. But what happens, as I told you, one of the symptoms is increase in the heart rate. If the patient is already taking these medication, this symptom will not be there. The only thing you can feel say, you can feel your muscle cramps, but these symptoms will not be there. So you have to keep this thing in the mind, even if you are not getting the increase in the heart rate and you should not think that, oh boy, it's, it's fine, I'm doing good. No, you will not get the symptom, but if you don't feel good, and you are outside in the sun, your breathing is faster, still you have to seek the medical advice. Now I know, I, I see, and I'm sure you do too, that there are a lot of folks whose uh, kidneys are not working normally, okay? They, 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 they're not on dialysis, I mean, it's not at that point, but um, it's very common to, you know, I have patients come to the office and, and we, we're doing various things and I'm reviewing their labs and I see that their kidney function is off, okay? And um, it really doesn't show up in the labs until yeah. a fair amount has happened. I mean, you've lost a lot of kidney function, okay? And the thing of it is when that's going on, you can't tell. You can't feel it, you're not aware of it, you don't know anything about it. And these are people who's, who's, who are still peeing normally, they're making urine normally, but the kidney as, as the filter for the blood is not working the way that it should. And it's not clearing things as well as it should. Okay? And so, you know, there's a lot of people who, who, are, in this, who are in this classification. All right? Now, are those people more susceptible to trouble in the yeah. heat? Exactly. These people are more susceptible. So it's a cycle. I'll tell you how. When when the, someone have heat and stroke, they, they release a muscle, because the muscle are damaging. So they release an enzyme, it's called myoglobin. It's a, it's a medical term. This myoglobin has to be filtered out of the kidney. If somebody have a kidney dysfunction, then this myoglobin will deposit in the kidney and it will make it worse. First thing, um, the damage, once it's done, it cannot be reversible until unless somebody act very reasonably and very fast. Um, 
Once your kidney, so you, so you can get permanent kidney damage. Yeah, 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 yeah. So as Dr. Grant told that we are not able to detect any kidney problem until unless you are 70 or 75 percent kidney function lost. You still make the pee. You don't have any blood in the urine. There is no way to find out. The, the time we will find out, your 80% of the kidney is already out. Mm. You have only 20% of kidney left, and you want, don't want to damage that 20% of kidney. That's crucial. That's very important. So that's why if you have symptoms, you have kidney dysfunction, you have to be more aware about this thing, that it can lead to permanent kidney failure. Can't stress that strongly enough. Uh, you know, a person who has 20% of kidney function does not have to be on dialysis. Yeah. Okay? And you want to talk about a life-changing event. Going on dialysis mm. is a life-changing event. My dad was on dialysis and it was life-changing. Oh, man. So you want to really, really protect that. And this gets back to, to people, and I, I'm talking to everybody who is hearing this. Okay, whenever you go to the doctor, you know, you can, you can ask specifically, you know, you just write, you write down things that you want to ask the doctor when you get to the office and one of the things you ask the doctor is, how's my kidney function? Yes. Ask them. That's They'll tell you. You know, they, you know your, your doctor, like Dr. Kumar sees his patients. I know because we have a lot of patients in common and I know that he, he's on top of all this stuff and he's checking the labs and, and doing the preventive and making sure people are okay. And as part of uh, what he does, there are routine labs that are done every year. That should be done every year. It's, it's, it's a screening process. And one of those labs will tell what the kidney function is. And, and, and so that's what, that's what doctors do. And when you go to the office, you can, if the subject doesn't come up, you can say point blank, how's my kidney function? And they'll tell you. And if it's a little bit off, you want to know that. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's normal, you want to know that. Yeah. I want to add uh, one thing. The kidney function test is just a blood test because sometimes patients come, oh, we don't want the biopsy or something. It's not it's nothing. It's just a blood test. They will take the blood and they will check the kidney function. Good, good point. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, no, a kidney biopsy doesn't happen until yeah. very late in the game. Yeah. Okay, so so you don't have to worry that somebody's going to stick you with. Yeah. No, that's not. <laughs> no, no, that's not going to happen. Not going to happen. You know, in the same <coughs> blood tests, the same blood tests. You know, you write down the second question is, how's my liver function? Yes. Because the doctor will be able from those blood tests be able to tell you how your liver's doing. Yes. Okay, and this is just part of knowing what's going on with you. And, you know, you might, you might think, well, gosh, why do I need to know all that stuff? We're talking about heat stroke here. We're talking about the fact that people who have compromise of their kidney function are at significant risk when they, when they get too hot. And if you're one of those people, obviously, you want to know it so you can take proper precautions and not get in trouble. That, that's the reason for it. So um, I hope that what's coming out of this conversation is that people realize that this is something you do need to take seriously. You do need to be aware of. It's uh, the kind of problems that come with heat stroke are preventable. You don't have to get into that kind of trouble. Recognize it early. If you start feeling off in the sun, and I have, I have. I've been in situations in my life where I was doing heavy work outside in the hot sun. And man, you can tell. I just, whoa, mm -hmm. gosh, you start feeling sick, you're, you start feeling woozy. Lightheaded. Lightheaded, and it's just off, okay? And so you're going to want to do something about that. Uh, and if, and if um, you can't get it under control quickly by doing the things that doctor said, getting out of the sun, getting the, getting the, the, the spray, turning on the fan. You, you should start, here's somebody and they're too hot, they're feeling, they're feeling off, they know that something's going on. They go inside, they kind of soak down, they turn on the fan. How soon should they start feeling better? 
uh, it's in the matter of minutes. It, they should feel good in 10 to 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes. Because once you spray your body, the heat just comes out. If it's not coming out, if you're not feeling better in, like, let's say I will reduce it to five to 10 minutes, then immediately call 911. There you go. There you go, folks. Couldn't be more clear. And, and heat stroke can happen to anybody, any yeah. age group. Yeah. Because you've got it, a lot of kids that go down to the lake and spend yeah, the whole yeah, day. Sure, down sure. It can, so m most common, it happens in the elderly population, okay. but it can happen to young guys too who work excessively. Mm -hmm. Like the athletes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, the kids, they also, they also can get heat stroke. Okay, very good. Yeah, athletes for sure can. Yeah. One of the other subjects we wanted to talk about today um, and Doc and I go back to the day when we just go outside and play. There wasn't a lot of work, a lot of word out there about protecting your skin when mm -hmm. we were kids. I mean, yeah, copper I tone, I think, was the only thing out there. Yeah, I'm that. not even sure what that really was. I don't yeah, either. I just remember the billboard. Yeah, yeah. right, right, with a little girl. Yeah. And uh, and lately, in the last several years, people have been come been made aware of the dangers of sun. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually, you know, from my growing up, I lived on the lake all my life, played golf and baseball and all that stuff, and was out in the sun constantly. And I had, I found these things on my face that turned out to be skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, I believe it's called. Yeah. And I uh, had to have them removed, and it, the doctor said, that didn't happen last week. That was from probably years ago when you were out in the sun not protecting yourself. So that's big on my category of... Uh, of uh, protecting our skin. Obviously, sun protection is very important. Yeah. So, so sun exposure, there are two kinds of exposure. One is the acute, one is the chronic. Acute means heat stroke, like you immediately go out, work out, and you get the heat stroke. Mm -hmm. What are you talking, it's about the chronic exposure. What happens with this? There are three kinds of cancer, most common with the sun, it's called basal cell, melanoma and squamous cell cancer. You don't need to know about this, they all skin cancer. So what happened in the sun rays, there are two kind of ultraviolet rays, it's called UVA and UVB. When they accumulate inside the skin for a longer period of time, let's say eight to 10 years, then at the end you may develop this kind of cancer. So. As you said, you were playing baseball, golf, so that means you were outside in the sun for the longer period of time, and that's why it happens. Um, what we can do to prevent this? Mm -hmm. We can, whenever we go out, we can wear the hat, which is down and cover the most part of body. We can wear the sun glasses. We can wear the full sleeves cloth. And on top of that, we can use the sunscreen cream whenever we expose. Does the sunscreen really, I mean, what does that actually do? Does it reflect the sun from your face or your body? Or? Yeah, it is. Uh, so th there is a filter in most of the sun sunscreen. And uh, most of the time, the filter is accurate. They reflect the ultraviolet rays. So that's out of 100%, they reflect 70%. So it means if you are not using sunscreen, you are getting 100%. If you are using sunscreen, you are getting only 8%. Okay. It's the ultraviolet that does the damage. <coughs> yeah, it's the ultraviolet. And the ultraviolet, uh, you know, basically what it does is it, is it injures the DNA mm -hmm. in your skin cells. Mm -hmm. It injures the DNA. And the body's pretty smart and it, it has all kinds of fancy little mechanisms to put the DNA back together again. But with that amount of exposure, it's going to make mistakes. And mistakes in the DNA are what can lead to cancers in the skin. So it's this accumulation of, of ultraviolet over the years that will damage the DNA to the point that you develop skin cancers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Doctor, perhaps you could comment. There are people, I know a lot of people who believe, okay, well, I'm, I, I, I'm going out and I got this great tan. And I really, I'm, and, you, and you see a man, a real deep tan, <laughs> you know? And they say, okay, well, I got this tan, I'm protected. 
I don't need to do anything. I'm, I'm protected because I Good have this point. tan. Yeah. Mm, uh, yeah. It's just the tan is not a protective, it's a protective mechanism of the skin, but it's not foolproof. You can still get the exposure and you still can get the cancer. It's not a foolproof mechanism. It's just the God has given us some capacity to fight for the ultraviolet, but it's not the solution. Mm -hmm. It's just the it just it just the protective mechanism. That's it. Like we get the flu vaccine, we can still get the flu, but it's a protective mechanism to protect against certain kind of virus. But you can still get the flu. Okay. And the other question that has to be asked, of course, is how did you get that tan? You didn't start off with the tan. Yes, yes. You had to go out and get the sun exposure mm -hmm. to get the tan. Mm -hmm. And that's when that's when you're really at risk because you don't have the tan yet yeah. to even get any little protection. Mm -hmm. So the sun is just in there blowing the DNA there away you while go. you're getting yeah. the tan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A good point. Good so point. you know, I mean it's in our culture it's really funny, you know. I mean a, a tan is um, it's a status symbol. It's a sign of yeah. health. You know, it really people think a... people think it's, it makes you look healthy. Right. Mm. It, it makes it's a status symbol. It's you know, it, it's it's a beauty thing. Mm. I mean, there there are even people who <coughs> who, who who spray it on. You know what I sure. mean? Sure. So <coughs> that being the point, so it's got a positive connotation mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. Tan equals good. Right. Okay. The problem is that. There are other equations that come into play here, like mm -hmm. tan equals melanoma. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> or tan equals squamous cell carcinoma. Yeah. Okay. And uh, not to put too fine a point on it, basal cell carcinoma usually does almost never invades. Mm -hmm. It'll sit there and grow and get big and get and get and get pretty pretty nasty, but you you, you remove it okay. Squamous cell carcinoma, pretty much the same. Every once in a while that spreads. Melanoma, yeah. different story. Mm -hmm. Melanoma is really dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, it can go to any organ. Even they remove the melanoma, it can regrow after 20 years. Is that it's right? A, it's, a, it's a unique cancer. It can occur in any organ, any time, anywhere. So you really don't want this type of cancer. So that's why it's still. I guess I'm going to ask both of you that uh, you know when I got this a couple of years ago, I got the fear, and I didn't want to go out in the sun much and uh, wear baseball caps and stuff to keep the sun off my face. Um, now, if I go to a farmer's market on a Saturday morning for 20 minutes, I mean, do I have to worry about putting sunscreen on then, or should I always have sunscreen on, or what? It's good. To have sunscreen every time you go out in the sun, okay. but certain things, um, it's it's true about the heat stroke as well. Um, whenever you go out in the sun, always wear sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's it doesn't matter. It's morning, afternoon, or evening. If you are out in the sun, it means you are getting ultraviolet. Simple. Uh, exactly. Um, the other thing is. Well, I'm just going to the farmer's market. Yes. I mean, I'm only going to be gone 20 minutes. I'll put right. my hat on. I'm just going to go out there. Oh, gosh, ran into a friend there or started talking to <laughs> yeah, somebody. Exactly. And, and he says, well, here, come see what I got in the back yeah. of my truck. And mm -hmm. then next thing you know, two hours have gone yeah. by. Yeah. Okay. That's so, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. That's and that does happen. Oh, man, all the time. Yeah, that's, that's called, that's that's called life. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so. It, it, you know, it, a little bit of a hassle, but so what? You get used to it, and, and, mm -hmm. and there you go. The other thing, uh, and Doctor alluded to this, he talked about sunglasses. The ultraviolet in your eyes mm -hmm. is bad news. Yeah. It is bad news. There are sunglasses available now. All you have to do is look and, and, and see. It'll say right on the on the label whether it protects from UV. Mm -hmm. They're not very expensive anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I, I myself. Any time I go outside, any time I get in my car, UV protection. Really? Period. End of story. Absolutely, because I've seen the data. Mm -hmm. I know what happens. And it's cumulative, too. Yeah. It builds up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were out. I mean, the stuff I did when I was a kid, I used to 
we used to be on Lake Michigan in the summertime. Okay, so you got the sun, but it's also reflecting off the water. Sure. Uh, okay, and I used to, and I, what I used to love to do back then was sail. We had a tiny you know, mm -hmm. little sailboat, and I'd go out in Lake Michigan in that thing. And I'd be out there for hours. Yep. No sunglasses. Yep. So, so far, I, I haven't, that seems like I haven't had to pay too high a price for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very, very careful about it mm -hmm. now because I know it's cumulative, and I, I really advise folks, you know, it can, it can screw up your vision permanently. I know that you're you're a fisherman, Doc, and uh, haven't had a chance to really do a lot. But, was I'm afraid? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when you go out fishing, do you put the sunscreen oh, on? If there's ever any place you should do it, it's by the water. Yeah. yeah. Especially, yeah. Because it, you know, it's going to reflect. It's not just coming down on you; it's yeah. reflecting up at you. Yeah. When I had a hot tub and it was outside, I didn't have to be in that hot tub very long, and I would come in and be burnt or brown. I would I would tan really quickly because it reflected off the water. That's right. Well, that's not good for you either. No, I mean it's you know it's gosh, why can't I just be free and run around in the sun? Well, you can, but you you have to understand you're paying a price if you do. Sure. So it's just a question of what makes sense to you and what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that. Uh, it's pretty clear that as our understanding grows about what the sun does and how it works and so on, that we, we understand that, well, things do happen, things can happen to us, but we're not helpless. We can protect ourselves. And I really appreciate Dr. having come by uh, today to tell us about this stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously our message to you, to you folks is just be aware that there's this big radiation source in the sky, hmm. and it's sending radiation at you. And that's the source of all life on this planet, of course, but it also has a flip side. Too much is not a good thing. Right. And so be aware of the heat, recognize it early, protect yourself. If there's any question, call 911, and use the sunglasses, use the hats, and use the sunscreen. Just Thank want you. to add two more lines. Absolutely. If you have if you have any plan to work outside in the summer, plan it for early morning and late evening. Very good. Do not do Very this good. thing in the afternoon. First thing. Second thing. Drink frequent water. Oh, that's very. Every hard. one or two hour. Do not drink too much water because it will. This regulate your electrolyte imbalance. Do not wait that you will be thirsty and you will drink water. Do not wait for the thirst because thirst is a sign of dehydration. Mm -hmm. That means take one or two glass of water every two hours. And uh, this is the main thing you can do. Uh, good point. And, you and the go ahead. Go ahead. okay. And the third thing. If you are thirsty and you think you are getting sign of dehydration, do not take coffee. Only take water, sports drink, or but no coffee, no caffeine containing. Why coffee. is that? Because when you take the coffee and the caffeine is going into your system, it will make you pee. So you are not gaining water; you are losing water. Uh, do not take coffee. That's a very good Would point. the same thing be with beer? Because beer makes you urinate also. Well, that's more volume. That's volume. That's yeah. the volume. Yeah. yeah. Caffeine, oh. th because you are drinking beer, you're taking out beer. Okay. okay. It's, it's the beer which is going out. But the caffeine is taking out your water. Uh. Uh, one way to think about it, Pat, is uh, he, here's two guys. And one, and one of them sits down to have some coffee, and the other one sits down to have some beer. Right. Who do you think is going to drink more total fluid? The beer drinker. Yes. So that's why, then. Uh, okay. that, that's that's why the pee there. But doctor did mention, you know, sports drinks or anything that has that has flavor and taste to it is going to have electrolytes. Yeah. It's probably going to be better than, than than water. But drinking frequently is is very important, and particularly for you folks who are 60 and older. Our thirst mechanism isn't as strong as we get older. In other words, our fluids can be getting less and less, but our body doesn't recognize it as fast or as strongly. So it's much easier for, for us, us seniors to get dehydrated. 
So it's a good idea if you know you're gonna be out in the heat to be on a schedule like doctor says. And even if you don't feel thirsty, drink, drink something. Water's okay as long as it's not too much. But if it's, but if it's something like a sports drink or lemonade or something like that, then, then you can drink as much as you want. Learned a lot today, Doc. It's great. I've been perfect timing for it too, because we just had summer started this week, so it's kicking in, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably going to wrap us for this week, Pat. Okay. Okay. Right. Real good. And uh, remember, your health matters. So if you have any questions, get a hold of Dr. Bryant. And he'll set up any kind of interviews that you would like to hear about. And uh, or we'll Pat too. Yeah. Or me too. You can email me at Nick One at Cable Suite Five Four One dot com. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week.